Hey, good afternoon. <clears throat> ah, finally got home, settled down. I'm a little chilly, so you can see I have a sweatshirt on. A uh, hot cup of coffee. I'm cuddled up in a nice chair and uh, actually just temporarily put the temperature up in the house just a little bit, just so I could warm up. It feels real to me today, the chill. You know, being out in the rain a little bit and uh, being a little tired. Maybe being older a little bit, I don't know, just kind of all came together and I uh, felt chilled. That's my perception, my reality, when in all actuality, it's pretty warm outside and muggy. And that's the truth. But a lot of times, it's not a matter of what's true and what's false. But it's what our perception of reality is. What we think is real and what the truth is are often two different things. So I feel kind of like today. Let me give you a word picture. I feel like I'm standing on the mountain on a cliff. And I feel like I have a wingsuit on. And I feel like the Lord is saying, just jump. I got this. Because what he's put in me uh, since yesterday afternoon, especially, to now, is just really a jump of faith. Is it real? Is it truth? I don't know. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered if the life you've been living by the many years or amount of time that you have, have you ever thought about the way you view life in general? You view people around you, maybe your family, your friends, maybe the way you view yourself. Did you ever stop to wonder if you really see the truth? of all of it? Or is it just a perception because of the filters that you've had and have developed through various circumstances, maybe times of crisis, times of trauma, good times? You see, everything that happens to us in life and all the decisions that we make eventually turn into the filters that we view our lives through. It doesn't mean it's reality. It means it's your reality. And see, if you look around you in the world right now, we have a whole bunch of people, including me, that we believe we know what reality looks like. When in fact, it's just a perception. How we perceive what's happened to us how we perceive the people that we're in relationship with, whether it's family, the church, friends, work, whatever. We're always casting a vision or our filters cast a vision and it's what we view life through. You know, the Lord, uh, <clears throat> back in December, I was staying at my kid's house, uh, watching their dogs for a bit, and uh, I had never tried virtual reality before. And it was kind of cool, because I could see myself inside of a virtual or false reality, or a made-up reality. And I looked different, but it was me. And I could see myself inside of things, looking at things from a different perspective. And it feels real. And if you didn't know better, I could say it was real. But I knew better. Because I knew once I took those glasses off and once I took the gloves off, once I set them down on the floor, I was back in another place. I'm going to mess with you a little bit here today because God has been messing with me. So I shared a scripture and I'm going to use this as the baseline here. Isaiah 45, 3. 
I will give you treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places that you may know that I'm the Lord, the one who calls you by name. And the reason that I'm using that scripture will be very apparent as we move forward. But let me preface it with this, and I'll repeat it again probably later. When dark times happen, and they've happened all throughout the history of the world, a lot of times we've been overcome spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, physically. We've just been overcome in different ways, and sometimes more than one way through tragedies that we've had to face as a people. Look at COVID a few years ago. Look how much damage it did and look how it changed a nation. People were afraid to go out. I mean, I was working at a big box store and I was checking receipts at the door and I can remember, I don't think I'll ever forget, a guy coming in with a hazmat suit on. Was I laughing? No. I felt sorry for him because fear had so taken over and maybe some health issues. I don't know, that he was so afraid that he had to dress like that. And then there was a lady when I went to take her receipt, she was all upset and said, I didn't want you to touch it. You remember if you lived through COVID, I was a long time of being separated and isolated and fed truth from the news, from health officials, who knows? Only God really knows the truth. We just know what we were told and we know what we perceived and we know the fear, the vision of fear that it gave us that if we got sick, what could happen? It's kind of like when Elijah saw what Jezebel said. I'm gonna kill you, Elijah, because you killed the prophets. I'm gonna take your life. And when he saw, he didn't literally see it. He saw it in, his, in a vision, in his mind's eye. Words create pictures. And when he saw what she said, he ran. And when COVID was here, when we saw what people were saying, we got scared. I heard the saddest story of a, an elderly woman who even three years or two years, I, I can't remember, maybe two years after COVID or almost two years, she still wouldn't go out of her house and nobody had gone into her house since COVID started and no, and she never left. She became a prisoner because she was too afraid to let anyone in or even go out. You know what happens a lot of times and uh, I've been learning about uh, how trauma affects a person, especially trauma that has come over a lifetime and seems is seemingly almost nonstop. When there's a great amount of it, every part of your being practically is still in hypervigilant mode. And it doesn't really get the chance unless there's a time where you just really have rest and peace and enough time to heal and enough time to come down. Whether you're not right back out there again. And it doesn't take much to set off a trigger. And I know that I have been living that kind of way for quite some time because I know that sometimes when I get into conversations, I can remember going to see the movie Cabrini. I can remember hearing songs. I can remember in that movie hearing things that went on in my own life. And I will tell you, I got so triggered that I literally felt like I was hearing a physical wind roar by my ears. And every part of me was in overdrive and self-protection. And when you experience homelessness, when you experience whatever it is that you experience that, and, and, and things can, experiences, people, all right, let me say this, people go through experiences, but they respond, react, uh, have their own perspective of what it is and what it is to them and how it affects them. And your perspective what you believe is how you experience it, a part of it. It's a lot, and it's hard to explain. But it's almost like this. When my kid's dad was in the hospital, they had him in Jackson Memorial, and they made a mistake on a doctor's order, and he was supposed to have blood taken, I don't know how often, but somebody wrote every hour or every two hours, and they kept coming in 
with needles. And I remember him calling me on the phone and crying and saying, I need you to come here. They keep doing this. I think it's a mistake. And he was crying. And he was a big guy. I am needle shy. I'm needle shy. And when you go through a lot of uh, trials and hard adversities and it just never seems to stop, you can become traumatized and triggered. And it doesn't take much sometimes to set you off. It depends. And everybody has their own. So when you look at people, I'm going to talk about myself because I don't know a lot about this. I'm learning. And I don't know what other people experience or feel. I only know my own. I know that I can be in a situation and everything be peaceful. And people can begin to have a conversation and it can be something that maybe I experienced that was very traumatizing. And if I don't excuse myself and leave the room and I sit in that conversation, if certain things are talked about, I get triggered. I mean, all of a sudden I feel the stress come on, almost like my blood pressure is going up and I get into this heightened fight or flight response. And my breathing changes and my heart rate changes and I can just feel it. I'm all about, give me my sword. That's what I'm all about. Or let me just get out of here. And it's not a very good feeling at all. It's a lot of pressure. It's almost like there's a tea kettle on inside of you and the heat comes and it builds and it builds and it builds until all of a sudden you just want to scream because the pressure is real, it's hot, and it's stressful. It's almost like you're having a tornado come up on the inside of you and you don't know how to release it. And what happens when you begin to feel that way, your fears begin to come. And like Elijah, you see what your old patterns of thinking are saying. Sometimes maybe it's Satan, it's the enemy, using your weakness to hurt you, to destroy your life. The word of God says he comes as a roaring lion to steal, kill, and destroy. It's a perfect opportunity. Wolves always attack sheep that are wounded and bleeding. It can be voices from your past. Voices that begin to rise up in you. Things that were spoken that belittled you or made you feel small, uh, rejected, not worthy, like you're nothing, like you're not important, or just a piece of furniture. Or maybe they didn't pay attention to you. I don't know what your situation is. But I know that that can be a part of it too. And then all of a sudden, the old tape recorder goes on in your mind. <laughs> and the Lord showed me this, and I've said it before. It's like ants. It's like your thoughts are a piece of cake thrown on the ground. And the ants go right to it, and they devour it. Piece by piece by piece by piece. And they carry it away. And I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm triggered, if I'm stressed, if I'm pressured... I can feel like that. My thoughts become ants almost. And there are just so many. And the fear rises and the anxiety. And all of a sudden I feel overwhelmed. And your body goes into this fight or flight thing and you just feel like you're just out of... Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. So then it's very hard. It's almost like you're in a jet and you're flying jets, and all of a sudden you get into a spin, a tailspin. So you want to recover fast, and you try. But the problem is we're not looking at the instruments to recover the plane in our panic. We're trying to find the sky, and we're trying to find the ground. And because we're in a tailspin, and it's going so fast, you just can't do it. And so you crash and burn. And I don't know about you, but I've crashed and burned enough, and I don't want to do it anymore. So how do we recover when thoughts come in and emotions flare up and they're almost like so automatic that you don't really have time to think about it? It's kind of like striking a match to a matchbook. Yeah. There's hardly time to think. So we have to come up with ways to be able to regain a sense of balance, composure, 
calm down, de-escalate, so we can think properly and calmly and use uh, what I'm learning to say, our wise mind, a balance of logic and not to ignore emotions. They need to be felt and expressed, but to realize that emotions can be like a roller coaster and they can change depending on the weather, depending on whether we've had sleep, depending on if we've had good nutrition, depending on so many things. So our emotions are not a gauge that's reliable. It's too changing. And while we need to feel them and experience them, and they're okay because God gave them to us, we have to realize that we do have to have boundaries put around them where we can keep them in a check and balance kind of thing. Where maybe on one side we're feeling what it is we feel and we're releasing it, but on the other, in a healthy way. And on the other side, we're, we're trying to regain that logical uh, part of us where we can break problems down a little bit at a time or even go into why am I feeling triggered let me get this a pencil or a pen and a paper and write down what my thoughts are and I'm going to encourage you to take issue challenge your thinking is it biblical because I don't know people and you know everybody's going to do what they're going to do but for me it's not about religion it's not about a church it's, it's not about a do or don't list. It's just about a relationship with our creator. And that's about as simple and as hard as it gets with me. I'm God's kid. That's it. I don't even have to say I'm a Christian. I'm just God's child. He died for me. He rose for me. He's never left me one moment in my best moments and in my totally flat out worst moments ever. He always stays and his love always stays and his companionship his nearness always stays and I've learned to hear his voice over the years like I heard the voice of a best friend if I'm separated in a store or in a field or at a concert I've learned him and I'm learning about him and he knows me and I know him and it's a level of intimacy that I wouldn't trade him for anything in the world I wouldn't trade Jesus for anything my relationship with him nope not anything and not anybody no matter who they are that's where my lines are drawn. So the thing is, is that we live in a world right now where there are too many voices. Too many, even mine. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm here to challenge the status quo. You know, it really bothers me because there are so many people saying whatever it is they want to say because they want to turn your perception to what they want it to be. It used to be a day and a certain level of integrity where I said journalists were told they just had to put the problem out there and keep their opinions out. I remember when I was small, growing up in a day, it didn't last long where I believe, if I remember correctly, people got up that were running for an office, whether president, vice president, and they told all about what they were going to do and not so much about what their opponent had done wrong. They didn't have to shame them or dress them down in front of the whole world. I think that's poor politics. I think it's poor form. I think it's bad sportsmanship all the way around. I think if you run for an office, you go in there and you tell your heart, what you want to do to see things improved and let people vote for you. Not because you're perfect, because I'll tell you what, I got my skeletons in the closet. You think King David's life was bad? Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. But I don't have anything to hide and I don't have any shame because Jesus has covered that shame. So I can be who I am, just as I am, anytime and show up and feel pretty good about me being there. I'm not going to say I always feel good about my behaviors sometimes. Things I say, things I do that sometimes still I wish I hadn't. It was a mistake. But I would not going to stand up and try to be pretend that I'm somebody I'm not. And I just think that if you're going to run for an office and you want to lead a country, you need to let people know who you really are and don't hide anything. You shouldn't have anything to hide because God covers you, especially if you belong to him. We just have to be real. Stop putting on the masks and stop pretending and stop believing that everybody in front of us doesn't have a mask on. 
you know, I listen to the news and I listen to the music and I listen to people and I'm watching, almost like watching a movie screen of how the Bible is playing out right in front of us. The devil has come to steal, kill, destroy, divide, isolate. And he makes you think it's a good thing to be a lone wolf, to be an island all by yourself, and that you can survive that way. And God made us for relationship. And he's a liar. The reason he wants you to believe that is because he wants to take you out of the picture. If you don't know Christ, he can take your salvation. And if you do know Christ and you fall for his lies, he can take your destiny. Because we each were made for a purpose and a part to play in this life. He comes in like light, but he's a liar. And he's got a hook underneath it all. And I'll tell you what, every single person that's living right now has lived or will ever live, either has the Holy Spirit of God on their life and living in them, if you know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Or, I hate to say this, whether you think you're a good person or not, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. It's just how it is. I didn't write the book, God did. And you're only carrying one of either. We are vessels. Vessels hold things. Yes, we have our own temperaments and our own personalities. But I'm telling you right now, and it isn't me, it's the Bible. And you can look it up and read it for yourself. You're either carrying the Spirit of God or you're carrying the Spirit of the Antichrist. And you're going to act out one of those and play out every day. Now, here's the other truth. When we lay our lives down and we die to self, our own will, our own ego, we learn God's ways, which is the truth, and we grow over time. We become more and more like him because he makes us more and more like him. And we have his character more and more because even as a child of God, I can still allow the devil to use the words I say or what I do sometimes. So it's not a perfect thing. It's not going to be till this is over. But the thing is, if you don't know Christ at all, you are fair game for the devil. And I'm sorry, all you people that are witches and Satanists and all that, you think you're in some elite thing because he has duped you because he has so duped himself. And he's going to use you to wreak destruction and hurt people and cause all kinds of pain and lie to you and make you think that you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. And when he's done with you, he's going to devour you too. Yeah. There's no winning with him. There's no winning. You know, we have so many religions. Oh my gosh. About as many people as there are almost in the universe, we have religions and beliefs. We are so twisted up and stinking thinking that we got kids thinking that they're dogs. And that they have a right to have a dog house in a school. And that's who they are. Come on. Really? Have we gotten that far away? We were made in God's image and in his likeness. Male and female. And I'm not against anybody, and I'm not in excluding anybody. I just think it's sad that all of us have bought the lie, the perception that we've been fed. And I hate to say this, not everybody in our federal government is a believer. So we are following people that maybe are trying to follow God's heart and imperfect, and that's great. That's what we need. But we're also following people that are being used by the devil to lead us down, to break us down as a people, keep us so busy, divide us, separate us, lie to us, cause fear, cause anxiety, cause dependence, and they want to dominate through fear. You know, if you look at the story of the Israelites, you know how Pharaoh conquered the Israelites? Through fear, through being a hard taskmaster through taking over their lives, taking away their freedoms, taking away their choices. And I hate to tell you, the United States is not a democracy anymore. They want you to think it is, but it isn't. Because more and more, more and more, like the darkness falls, dusk and darkness, yeah, it's fallen on our country. It's fallen across the world. And you know, the only time that people were put in prison and that people were assassinated back then, or their lives were taken were the people that stood up to tell the truth because people wanted to suppress them because they didn't want people to be free. They want them to be in bondage. They want to be in power. They want to control. And it's about time that we wake up. You know, Isaiah 52 
the Lord spoke about Jerusalem, but it's really a word for the church. It's a word for everyone. Our old ways of thinking, our thought patterns, the experiences we've had, the perceptions we think are reality, they're all a rhetoric that's not true, that we have come to believe. And I'm telling you, because I've lived it. And I'm not going to tell you to believe. I'm going to offer you a challenge. If you don't think God is real, that's fine. If you do think he's real, but don't follow him, that's fine. And if you are a believer, but not all in, that's fine. And even if you are a believer all in, that's fine. No matter who you are, what you believe, it's fine. But I'm going to issue a challenge and set it before you. The Lord says, taste and see that he's good. Prove me, he says. So I'm going to ask you, have you proven to see if God really exists or not? Because you can't even begin to tell me that he's not if you haven't. You can say what you want, but it doesn't mean you're right. You can say what you think, but it doesn't mean it's true. You know, gravity is a law. And if I wanted to believe something else because I wanted it to be different, I could. I could tell everybody around me that gravity does not exist. But I will promise you this, that if I go up on my roof and jump off, I'm not going to jump and touch the moon. I'm going to hit the ground. Because whether I want to believe it or not, gravity is a law of nature that God created. And it's the truth. You know, the other thing is, to me, it takes more faith to believe that God doesn't exist for me than it does to say he does. Because every single thing that I witness outside every day in babies being born and people that are in front of me tells me that everything is so intricately planned, woven together, our bodies, every cell, our oxygen we breathe, the world spinning in space. I'm sorry. If you don't think God exists and you think that was just some freak accident, good for you. You got way more faith than I do. I don't. My faith is not in something I think or wish or hope for. My faith is founded on a relationship with Jesus that he has proven over 35 years that every word he says is true. So I can say I know he is. I've experienced him. It's not just a thought. It's a relationship. And he keeps showing up and proving himself and his word to be true all the time. The other thing that is uh, really important is questioning. What is true? What is real? What is a lie? Do you ever think about that? How many times do I say, well, they said, well, who's they? And how do we know what they said is true? Google isn't God. Sometimes that's where we get all our information from. It's a cheat sheet. And now with AI, pff, I can get a lot of answers in less than a minute doesn't mean it's the truth. You see, I think as a nation, as a world, we need to start really questioning what we believe. Questioning whatever comes at us in the form of a spoken word to know where it's coming from. And is it a fact? Is it the truth? Or is it just a perception? Or is it a lie? Outright. The reason I'm throwing out this challenge is not just about God, but we live in a world full of anxiety, stress, and people ending their lives early. Kids! And we live so isolated in a time when there's more people in the world than I think there's ever been. And yet we're so isolated. I was telling a friend of mine today, Sandra Bullock, when I was probably 1990s, came out with the movie, The Net. And I was telling her, have you ever seen it? And she said, no. I said, well, I'll tell you what, that's pretty prophetic. Because back then it was the beginning of something like that. And people thought, wow, that's weird. And now we're actually living it. People isolate themselves. They work out of the house. They talk to people virtually. Heck, you, you can even go to the emergency room and still talk to a doctor on a camera that's somewhere far away. Counseling sessions. Everything is on our phone. And now we got AI to come in. We don't have to think anymore. I'll tell you a funny thing. And it was, it was pretty wild. I actually put 
uh, my name, my nickname, River, in a song. And I asked, I think it was Copilot, the AI, I asked it to write me a song. And within less than a minute or two, it came up with a beautiful song. And I thought, come on, this was too fast. So I copied, pasted it, put it in Google just to see if it came up as a song. Nowhere to be found. And being a writer now and learning about writing, do I want to write it myself? Out of the inspiration the Holy Spirit gives me, out of, out of beauty that I see, what I behold, out of creativity that God is a creator and I bear his image, so I have some creativity and certain unique gifts like you, maybe in music that you have. I don't know. But do I want to just give that up? That's part of my birthright as a daughter of God. And just go to some machine and say, hey, I'm going to throw this in, just spit me out something good. And it probably will. But do I want to do that? Do I want to be mindless, thoughtless? Do I want to turn into a machine? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the machines that they are creating and giving thoughts to act more and more like humans. And we're being asked to leave our jobs so that they can run companies computerized, digitally. Where's it going to leave us? I think they're trying to make us mindless machines while they put the machines to work. They make the money. And what do we get? Dementia? I mean, what happens to your brain if, he doesn't use it, if you don't use it? It's like every other muscle in your body. What you don't use, you lose. So I guess I'm throwing this out today. And you know, the other thing is if you're a person who's been through a lot and you experience trauma, I'm going to ask you to do what I'm going to do. I want to start taking uh, time when I feel those triggers to come on to sit down, even while I'm feeling that stress, and to begin to write down the thoughts that I'm having, to go to the Word of God, go into prayer, and to challenge my thinking. And to start accepting the truth that the Holy Spirit gives me from his word in the middle of a triggered event. And if it means that first I have to sit when I'm feeling that way and ground myself somehow, whether it's just focusing on that North Star that I had shared in a video and just breathing, whether it's praying, putting on music, worshiping, whatever it looks like for you, to bring you down to the place where you can begin to think rationally and logically and let your emotions de-escalate and then begin to look at the thoughts that you're thinking. I think the best time to do it, honestly, is while we're triggered. Just, what am I thinking? And I'm just going to write it down. I'm just going to write it all out. I'm not going to try to figure out everything I'm thinking that I'm writing right now. Right now, I'm just going to write. And when I'm empty and I feel like there's nothing else I can write down, I'm going to go back to each one of those after I've calmed down. And I'm going to ask the Lord to show me what is true here. Not what I think is real. My perception can feel like reality, but it doesn't mean it is. Tell me the truth. And then when I think when I begin to do that, I can start to learn where my triggers are, what starts those old destructive ways of thinking, those hurtful ways of thinking what gets me all worked up, and I begin to incorporate the truth of God in new ways of thinking. And actually, if it's a problem, to look at it from different perspectives with his help, and maybe the help of people I trust so that I can learn to problem solve and think different thoughts, so that my thoughts don't become like cake on a sidewalk that the ants devour, but that I can have healthy thoughts and healthy perspectives and different ways of looking at a problem and develop new thoughts. And it doesn't even have to be a pattern anymore. I just want to begin to use my mind as a beautiful thing, to use my thoughts as something that does see the truth and knows the truth, but also is open enough to think about a problem in different ways and how to solve it. To have better mental health, better emotional health, and to learn how over time 
to quiet myself with the Lord. I really believe coming back to that verse, Isaiah 45, 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places that you may know that I'm the Lord, the one who calls you by name. Those treasures, those riches in the middle of a dark time in your life are actually you looking for truth in the middle of a dark time. And when God reveals those truth from his word and by his spirit, and I'm telling you, I'm not going to talk about not doing it without him because it doesn't happen. The truth that he gives me is what I need to replace the lies that I've been believing and that causes me distress. And I know it can come from hard times, times being in the war. Maybe you served on the police force for a long time. Maybe you've had a terrible experience in your life that has caused you post-traumatic stress, flashbacks, triggers, all kinds of things. Maybe you've experienced one thing after another. But what I'm saying is we have to be active in helping ourselves to get well. And I know I can't get well without God, without his word. And I'm going to tell you this one last thing. You have to be careful who you go and talk to as well. Counselors are great. But for me, I always ask the Lord, I need somebody who has the truth of your word that's full of the spirit, not perfect, but that can help me. And it's been amazing because I've gone to people. Actually, I was sent to someone when I was young. And when I walked in the office as a teenager, the first one of the first things they said was, welcome, this is the devil's world. I didn't even know God. That freaked me out. And all I could think of was, dude, you need help more than I do. And I remember being hypnotized. And I remember seeing my older version of myself running to the younger version of myself, picking myself up and running away. And I never went back. I never went back to that counselor. A couple times that was it, because he freaked me out. We have to be careful of the voices that we're listening to. And we have to take responsibility to learn the truth, because truth really is. It's not relative. It's not. There are our absolutes. God created this world. He is the absolutely the only God there is and the absolute creator of everything that you see. And you've got to align your thoughts with his and know it's not brainwashing. I'm going to tell you what's brainwashing. What's brainwashing is when you're fed a steady diatribe of destructive thoughts, of lies. I can't convince you. I'm not here to try to convince you. I'm just trying to tell you my own experience. And that the more I walk with God, the more I'm freed from bondage of old patterns of cyclical thinking that were destructive for my life. And not only for me, but for my family and for all those around me. And it's the same for every one of us. I'm not the only one. The more we learn to get well in our thought life and we stick to truth, the true north on the compass, the better life will be. The more we are equipped and empowered to handle tough times of adversity and come through it more or less unscathed than when we don't have the truth. And it's almost like a wave that swallows us up in a riptide. You know, I know that this is of God because today I even went to a writing class today and uh, the leader of the writing class wrote a piece about just the same thing, just said in a different way. We have to start taking responsibility for our own lives, the choices we make, who we follow, what we believe. And I'm going to tell you this. The, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you know his word and you dine on it and you meditate on it and you feed on it. And the more you know the truth, the freer you become and the less anxious you feel in a world that we live in right now that's really getting pretty dark. It's not hopeless. And I'll tell you why. 
So don't let this create so much fear and anxiety. You feel like, well, that's it. I'm done. Don't. No, that's not it at all. Because at the end of the word of God, Jesus has already won. And there's a new world coming. And not the new world order you hear. But it's new. All things are going to be made new. You know, from the movie, uh, well, I think it was just J.R. Tolkien. I can't remember. But I believe he said, everything sad is coming untrue. Think about that. Everything sad is coming untrue. The more, as time goes on, it may get a little bit darker. It's always darkest before the dawn. But there is a new day coming and a dawn. And Jesus Christ is the hope of this world. And he's the light of it. And I'm telling you that if you run to him and take your refuge in Jesus, through the cross, his death and resurrection to save your life, from living in eternity without him. Instead, you can live in eternity with him where there'll be no more tears and no more pain and no more crying, no more evil to deal with. And it's coming. You gotta hang on. And he is the hope. He is a hope. And the war is already won in the spirit. We're just walking this thing out in the natural until it's done. But the war is already won. So you're a part of a story where at the end of it, Jesus has already won. And it will never be the same after that. So hang on. Have hope. Be courageous. The Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. Surely I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise from the word of God. Psalm 91, hide yourself under the shadow of his wings. And the word of God says, hide yourself in me till all these calamities pass by. He is your shelter, your refuge, and your protection. And he will give you strength and protect you. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, and he delivers them. This poor man cried out, and the Lord delivered him from all his troubles. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Everyone, everyone. The word of God says that he makes all things work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And right now he's just given me this as a last thing. Let's say that you're going to make a cake. Let's say you put all the ingredients on the table. Now let's say life is kind of like a recipe. And there's ingredients all over the place. Well, let's say that in your recipe, it calls for salt. So let's say that instead of putting all the ingredients together to see what happens, maybe it's a great cake, maybe it's chocolate if you like that, and uh, I don't know, maybe it has raspberry filling, and maybe a great frosting, it's beautiful, and it tastes great. That's kind of God taking everything, all of those separate ingredients, and making them all work together to come out for something perfectly beautiful and wonderful. But what happens if instead of putting all those ingredients together, you just eat them individually? The salt by itself tastes terrible. Baking powder by itself is awful. So, you know, you may be experiencing a part of life that on its own, and especially apart from God, just doesn't go down very well. And it tastes awful. Maybe it's better. But I promise you that if you accept Jesus into your life, you know you need a Savior. You know you need somebody, not as a Lord to boss over you, but as a Lord that is a father, a perfect dad. Maybe you don't know what that looks like either. But just know this. It's somebody that will love you and unconditionally never leave you, that cares about your life so much, he wants to take your hand and walk you through this life and see that you're protected and cared for and provided for and he'll always be there. And he'll stay with you until you're with him forever. I like that alternative. And that's not just, that's not false. And it's not even my perception. It's the word of God. And it's real. And it's truth. It's truth. So have hope. 
abounding hope. Because the source of your hope is closer than your own breath. Have a great day.